Hi, Shuyi, it's Merlin. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself so people oh, know who we are? Sure. Hi, I'm Shuyi Scott. I'm a cello teacher and I live in Austin, Texas. I love teaching my students and I love coaching teachers. Um, if you'd like to know more about me, just go to shuicello.com. And how about Merlin? Nice. So I'm Merlin Thompson. I also have a website. It's at MerlinThompson.com. And I have a podcast series there. It's called The Music Educator's Crucible. And uh, who am I? I'm a piano teacher. I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm really excited. I hope our conversation will get more teachers share their thoughts and, um, and questions so we can have more and more learning experience for, for both of us and for everybody in the teacher's community. Sounds good. Absolutely great. I think both of us were slightly disappointed <laughs> at the lesson. Whoa, what happened here? And, and I think, um, yeah, something, something was missing. And, but like you said, it could be, it's, it's, we're in this messiness yeah. stage now, uh, before yeah. it was all this excitement. Yes. I need to make sure this Boeing's right. This notes are right. I'm so excited. I'm learning this piece. And then this week, I, I know this piece and I, maybe he's practicing his, in, in his own way. He's also more of a quiet person. So I will ask him something. He will give me minimal information. <laughs> he's very visual. So I often will draw something of just a round circle and tell him like each of a sound you make is this round circle rather than a word. So he, he's very visual thing. If I draw a crescendo this way, then he'll play crescendo. But if I say it, it's, it's not as, as effective. Yeah. For me, it sounds like he's on a plateau. Mm. And so there's things that, um, probably need to be internalized before you can add on or make anything go forward. And so the, and the challenge with plateaus is that Mm, we get impatient. We think, you know, that I, this is the same thing as I did yesterday. Why isn't it any better? And I like to remind my students every once in a while that not practicing is the way that you can get better. Mm. That practicing isn't the only way of getting better. Mm. And um, I always give the example of my myself, um, you know, when I was in university, I may have told you this before, but you know, when you're in university and you got a jury coming up, you've got tons of repertoire to get ready. And your teacher may week after week only hear one of those pieces until the one day when they say, oh, I haven't heard that Chopin for a couple of weeks. And you go, oh, and I haven't played that Chopin for a couple of weeks either in your mind. And the teacher says, and I'd love to hear that today. And you launch yourself into the piece and it turns out basically okay. And the teacher says, oh, that's so good. You've been working on the Chopin. And you don't say a word that you haven't been working on the Chopin at all. You just say, oh, yeah, thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always share that story with my students. Yes, 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 totally. When our mind gets to focus at, into one's point, we forget that the whole immersion, the big picture is, is definitely yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing because yeah, I have a similar experience. Oops. You know, I need to play this box suite now. Okay. And yeah. it turned out <laughs> like, oh yeah. The time for internalizing, uh, a piece of music, a very, very interesting part about human learning is not on the surface of our, right. Um, yeah. Our thinking. Yeah, well, it's meant for me that I never use the statement. So I see you've been practicing that piece a lot. I never use that statement in my teaching. Wow. Because that statement indicates that I may be seeing things that aren't happening at all. Mm -hmm. And I prefer to get information from the student to tell me what's going on. So if they say, oh, I didn't practice that piece at all this week. I just go, well, that's fantastic. That means you have a fresh 
we can just look at that piece fresh today as opposed to i didn't practice the piece at all and it's probably going to turn out really awful yes for right. me i just go well that is a possibility but there's also a possibility that with this this you know temporary kind of vacation that we have we've let go of a few things and now we're going to find out what hasn't been what has been internalized and what hasn't been internalized right 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 yeah that's very good yes i, I have i remember some of a conversation like that um like you said oh the student played really well was very relaxed poised and and just carefree and yeah and then uh, no, it will have a conversation just like what you said. Oh, I actually didn't really think about practicing that one, <laughs> um, you know. And you know, but often time I think that's where, um, like you said, talk, talking about oh, something is already so deep. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to think about it anymore, and that's the yeah. the, the great um, level of learning a learning a piece or or a a, a skill, right? I think it's because the our experience and so your experience tested by time so you know that okay yeah this point is going to be all right because we're going to the next point it will, it will be different it's, yeah. it's definitely not one plus one equals to two <laughs> but so in your case when your student after they they were free without the piano bench blocking their way to the chair uh, to the piano how do you go about that transition into the okay now there's a bench <laughs> yeah i think um it, it happens pretty quickly and it probably even happens in that very first lesson that we that we get from this informal place of just you know let's just see what happens mm -hmm. to knowing that oh standing up at home uh will be good for interest and investment um, but they're probably going to get tired if they only stand up all the time so sitting on the bench yeah so so the bench doesn't get taken away for very long mm -hmm. um and i guess what i'm looking to to do more of is to set up this environment of i guess it is interest that's what i'm really looking to do mm -hmm. so if if i got the interest there then bringing the bench in and um you know, exploring whatever we decide to do next. Um, that just seems like the natural thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Because after standing for a while, you do want to <laughs> sit down and then the bench becomes the, yeah. oh yeah, that makes sense. I should sit down yeah. and I should um, sit down the, the you know comfortable way that I can reach this part and that part right. of, the, of the keyboard. And they see me sitting down. So it's not like, oh, I don't know what to do when I sit down. Like, how am I going to get, where does that example come from? No, I'm sitting down at the piano. They see me doing that. So yes. it's only natural that they would do that as well. Right. When I introduced the stool and uh, mat, kind of foreign to them. So I always have some games to get them familiar with that, that kind of new setting. Similarly, I would do like stand up and jack in the box kind of game to help them get familiar with that new position. Even when they start learning playing Twinkle in a lesson for young kids, I always encourage them to stand up and do some dance when I play a musical cue that they, they get to stand up and be free. It's not natural for a young kid to sit down the whole time for 20 minutes without Right. Moving. Yeah, I do something very similar. I do um, I push the bench back and we walk around a couple of times. Uh, important things for me are breathing. So let's do let's breathe deeply as we walk around. Let's maybe even do a couple of stretches as we're walking. And so whereas we've been in this very kind of closed position at the piano where, you know, everything is just in the right place. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's, that's a good goal. Um, so I just want to take all that away and say, yeah, jump, let's get off the bench. And it usually comes, I can pretty much anticipate it. Although yesterday I was thinking, I was teaching a book to student and I could see he he lifted his eyebrows at a certain point. And I thought, oh, that's a sign. Something's going on. Jump off the bench. And he looked at me, what, what are you doing? I'm, we're off the bench. I'm doing my stretches. I'm getting my breathing going. And I could see that he just reached a little point of kind of exhaustion. He wasn't complete exhaustion, but just enough to say that, 
oh, I've really worked hard at whatever it is that we're doing now. Can we, can we stop doing this? And I caught the sign right there off the bench. We did some stretches and, uh, you know, 30 seconds later, we're back to full whatever it is that we were doing before. So absolutely. And I think for me, what is fun about that is it ties in with, again, the whole learning process that when we and and we there is this assumption that you know if you just keep on constant get through if you work through that moment when you can't concentrate anymore it'll be really great on the other side i don't know that there's any research that actually proves that that's the case mm -hmm. and it kind of just you know it, it ties in with what we talked about the last time about the western and eastern visions of discipline and what it means to be a disciplined individual to overcome when your concentration is fading yeah for me the easiest way to overcome your concentration when it's fading is to not resist and let it go do something else and come back yeah i think uh, as adults we do that all the time like oh i i need a break but um when we're in the lesson uh that doesn't occur as much because we feel like oh this is you pay for so i need to teach 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 and yes. the student student you know feels the same way you know and the parents like why are we not doing serious stuff <laughs> yeah um, yeah it's the efficiency model isn't it yes so yeah. how can we can we get the most out of this 30 minute lesson what are we going to do i'm going to have this 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 can have these activities are going to join one to the other and i've got the perfect sequence worked out yeah it may work out once yeah. <laughs> and the next time you may have to do something completely different right right that's why i like to remind myself sometime before the end of a lesson as a student i'm curious what you remember from this lesson if you you know if you're going to tell your classmate what you learned from this lesson yeah. and and i found that like a lot of time they will get stunned and like ooh, i don't know i just no idea i just go home and i just repeat this song again you know yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's always a good way to to first check how my communication skill mm -hmm is uh, and then if it's interesting they will remember what aspect to practice and, yeah and also another thing like when you were talking about detect if a student is like at the limit of their uh, focus level i do that quite well with very young children but i often i tend to forget when they're older you know i tend to think that all oh, older kids they can survive through a 50 minute lesson no problem <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and i forget like yeah i know especially especially during this pandemic kids get tired very very yeah um, very easily and and you know uh, with yeah less less um the endurance is definitely less so um and if I remember to ask them, well, what do you think, you know, uh, and have a break, have have uh, somewhere during a lesson, have more frequent two way communication seem to uh, help more uh, for the online lessons. Um, so, yeah, it's a very nice reminder <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, I find myself these days with my teenagers um, being really aware that they're tired. And I find myself very frequently uh, reinforcing and validating for them that it's, it's really good that they recognize that they're tired. And it's really good that they take uh, appropriate action, which is to go have a, have a snack, have a snack, have a snack or have a nap. Right, right. So, so change what's happening with your energy. Um, having a snack, you can change your energy level that way. But also having a nap, and it doesn't mean you know you have to. Um, you're going to fall asleep for three hours, and it may. And if you do fall asleep for three hours, um, that's your body really telling you something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I find myself, you know, when you know one of my students says you, that she's tired, I say, "Oh, good, good for you. You're paying attention." Mm -hmm. you you're recognizing your your body's giving you messages mm -hmm. and i and i just try to say something i i want to be the person that encourages you to listen to the messages that you're getting from your body right yeah that's a that's a really good point 
Um, and I think a lot of times that's where the injury occurred, right? Because we we fail to listen to our own bodies. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. We all know their brains work so differently, right? Um, and so important for them. So important to give them the um, the freedom. Of, oh, maybe think about your body, how your body is telling you. It ha has happened to one of my students who looks so exhausted. Um, but after, you know, after I asked him, have you had any water yet today? And mm -hmm. he realized he's not uh, yeah. properly. Um, after that, that helped a lot. So sometimes just this simple, very simple physical uh, need that um, that can help with, with the lesson. If this were not a teacher taking it personally, then it would be a very sad disaster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, in the long in the long run, we're hoping that, you know, children, young people, teens, that they're going to become so good at listening to their own inner voice, mm -hmm. that when they grow up and they're faced with more challenging ch challenges, mm -hmm. that that in that they will they will have that trust and the experience of listening to their own inner voice and responding in multiple appropriate ways mm -hmm. right and and all um this l different layers of their self-discovery can happen in a music lesson yeah that's why it's such a interesting like different planets and different you know in a learning music learning universe and, yeah. yeah yeah and we have the opportunity i i I think I'll talk about awareness, but I'd like the expression shared awareness a lot lately. So it's not just the idea, so that I'm aware my student's tired, okay? But she knows that I'm aware of her fatigue. So we're sharing our personal awareness with each other. And for me, that's where the really interesting things about relationships starts to happen. It's when you're sharing awareness with each other. And part of that comes through, well, part of, it comes through communication and it's about using our words mm -hmm. to share our awareness with our students as well. Mm -hmm, mm hmm yes that way they they notice that they have been cared about yeah. that they are they notice that this little they might think is a deficiency oh i'm not doing this well enough but if we provide possible scenario behind it they will not be so self-criticizing right as often happen to preteen and teenage if we provide this kind of communication they will feel more hopefully think deeper, right? Oh, I mm -hmm. feel this way because there might be other factors uh, causing me not playing very well right now. Um, it's not just, I'm not very good at this. It's not just, I didn't have enough time. It's not just, I have too much homework, I can't do this. I think that's this really precious aspect in the one-on-one -on -one lesson that makes it, makes it so special. We always look, go back to the human connection yes play. but the other way i think about this is i always tell my teacher participants that teaching itself is an art form it should not be just oh i'm a performer but i have some free time so i teach some on this yeah. side it's yeah i think teaching itself if it's an art form it has its own category like all the great ingredients that you mentioned in your mm -hmm. podcasts that it really helps the teachers to think a lot higher about how they do. I really think this kind of discussion that we're having can hopefully give more teachers to think about what they are doing is really unique and special. <laughs> yeah, and it's so different from teaching the repertoire. Mm-hmm, exactly. So the repertoires can be, the repertoire can be quite clear. Teaching technique can be quite clear. Um, working through learning uh, can be quite convoluted by comparison. Working through relationships can be clear and unclear. Yeah. I think that's why we want to have this chat to hopefully help more teachers. Yeah, I like the word, I like to, 
I like to lead with the word authenticity. Mm-hmm. Authenticity, you know, I had, I was talking with someone earlier this week and um, she said she noticed that uh, the word excellence was being used a lot within her teaching circle. Teachers are really focused on excellence, focused on excellence. And I thought that's a really powerful word um, that can be manipulated into c- control. So because I've got excellence in mind, I'm going to control everything that you do. Yes. And I said, you know, for me, I don't want to get rid of excellence. I don't want to put that to, I don't want it to to go away. But I think if I've got excellence and authenticity, if I'm authentic, bringing out my authentic student, I'm treating, I'm dealing with them as who they are then I think I've got the right kind of calibrations going on with those two things. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I totally agree with you about the authenticity of the teacher and uh, also authenticity of the student Yeah. before you talk about excellence. And I, just like you said, it's so easy to say, oh, excellence of something, and therefore you must listen to me, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> also, just like that can be easily equated to successful teaching right that's that's the risk we're taking is yeah then just that notion of oh excellence in performing equates ex- successful teaching i already see the student space and the authenticity of the student go under <laughs> yeah or yeah we just put it to the side because it gets in the way so if I have to think about what the student needs all the time, oh, we're just not going to get anywhere. But right. for me, it is that whole building on and exercising kind of idea that, you know, the student comes already, the student already has their personality, their, what can I say, their patterns, the way they go through life, uh, th- those, two, those things are already there. And it's a real adventure for me to find out what those things are. Right. That reminds me of one of the books you mentioned in the last, the book, Quiet. Yes. You no, know, because I think yeah. when you have a um, quieter student or introvert students, I have students who will be so comfortable and so happy not to be asked <laughs> what's in their mind. How do we invite the introvert into equal playground? rather than just the teachers talking the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other day I I have one, I guess he would be my most introverted student. I asked him three very uh, interesting questions uh, because we were, I, you know, I, in one of my podcasts I talk, I, it's called uh, Technique on a Universal Scale. And I talk about core, breath, and energy. And I thought, okay, um, this is year two, I've been using these words around forever. Um, let's just see what happens. So I said, um, can you tell me where is the core? And he didn't tell me. He, he turned so that I could see his back and he moved his hand up and down his back, probably only the lower two thirds. I said, uh, yes, right on. fantastic. Um, where's your breath? And he went this, and just down here, he didn't go too far, he just went about here, just that. Oh. And then I said, and where, can you, what, but what about energy? Where's your energy? And I could see, oh, this is gonna take a bit of time, you know, and we're online, you know, we're, not, we're on Skype. <laughs> and so he's thinking, and then he leans over, and I can see him touch his feet, touch his legs, move his hands up, until he's done the whole thing. Oh, wow. And I said, yes. And so it's much easier for me just to say, put your energy in the piece than yes. to say, put your whole body. Mm-hmm. If I say energy, you can choose if you want to use your whole body or you want to use your core or you want to use your breath or whatever it is that you want to do. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yeah, got lots of information. He didn't say a word through the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, that's wonderful. And may I ask how what the age? He so is? this guy would be about ten. Mm. And I think what was key for me was that um, the key. You know, I've talked about this elsewhere, 
asking children questions that they can answer. So that implies that they have words to answer. But I also think it's asking questions that they can answer without words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So suddenly that just went through my mind mm -hmm. that there is this stage of developing comfort in terms of communication with the teacher. Um, part of it is talking and observing and seeing what you see and then asking questions as well. And I've all used this expression, you know, ask questions that you know the students can answer, like what's your favorite color or what's your birthday or something. But I'm also thinking now, this just came spontaneously, mm -hmm. right at very instant, that we have to be open to students answering questions without words. Yes, right. And that's kind of go, uh, also goes back to, uh, earlier, you were saying you do a wrong example and let the student uh, yeah. talk to you. And so it's like my cello doctor thing, a lot of with my introvert students or online because we can't really talk at the same time. I have a fun Zoom group class game is the students will hold their bow up if the answer is no, and they'll put their bow down on their string if the answer is yes. Nice. So that way I can he I can see all of them answering me yeah. at the same time. And not, what you just said is amazing. That he was silent the whole time. You know, the, the way you describe it is like he was very expressive. Yes. <laughs> he just yeah. didn't use words. Yeah. yeah I did have a student once. So she's, a, she's probably a university in her last years of university now. She's my student for 10 years. And the first three years, she didn't speak, speak one word. She's very shy. Um, and I understood from her mom that she only spoke at home. She didn't talk at school or in kindergarten or any of those places. She talked to no one. And so here was a very interesting thing. Uh, the students started lessons. I think she had one, and her mom became quite ill. And her mom said, would you be okay? Uh, no, she didn't ask me. She just said, this child will be coming to lessons with her cousin who has a driver's license mm -hmm. <laughs> and can drive her on a weekly basis. And I won't be practicing with her at home. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, okay, whatever. And so, you know, the little girl came and I could, oh, I became very good at answering, asking questions that she could nod her head or shake her head to do yes or no, because those were the only two answers that I could get. Yes. And, and it persisted. I, I say persisted. I was quite accepting of the situation. And I knew that, you know, this was a long, going to be a long process. Three years, I would say at least with only yes and no questions. And then we progressed to one or two words in junior high. I think she maybe would say a complete sentence, but it was very, it took her a full minute to say five words. It was so much effort for her. Oh, wow. What does she do now? Well, when she got to university, mm -hmm. uh, she wanted to make extra money on the side. She formed her own company. It's a tutoring company. She hires other university students who might be second or third year university students to coach first year stu university students who are paying her for tutoring uh, in, in university. So is she having to interview all these, you know, pr prospective people who are going to be working for her? Yeah. She's going to have to be interviewing all these prospective candidates who want to, you know, to get tutoring from her. Is she talking? Absolutely. She's talking. She's got to have the most convincing vocabulary on earth, this young person. Yeah. And there she is. That's interesting. Yeah. I was, because I was about to ask you when you said it, it took her four or five minutes to, to complete a sentence. I was going to ask you, was she diagnosed with any, any situation, any condition? No, it was about a minute, but in that minute, she probably only said a total of five words. Mm. And me, I just was sitting there going patient and being patient, being patient. And on to every once in a while, I would, you know, just chime in. Thank you for that. And all we go. Mm. Yeah. It was very interesting. Communication wise, mm -hmm. it's up to me. I realize it's up to me. It's not up to my students to make it work. Mm -hmm. It's up to me. 
-hmm. And, you know, this is a different thing in the past. You know, if we look back 50 years ago, if the student didn't ask a question, it was their fault. <laughs> You know, if they didn't express what they were interested in, it was their fault. Yes. Uh, the teacher's not a mind reader was the big thing. The people who right. said, I'm not a mind reader, and I'm not in charge of whether you're motivated or not. And all of that, yes, but um, I can read minds <laughs> yes. to a certain extent. Yes. And I can be a, be a recognizer of autonomy and what it means to cultivate that young person's autonomy i know what that means mm -hmm. right and also like um, um when you when you were talking about this uh, I, you know it reminded me like uh, you know routinely we we teachers will ask oh do you have any any questions at to finish a, a session and oftentimes no i don't have any questions but um we teachers in a private lesson we need to think about are the students comfortable enough to ask questions right. <laughs> or do we go back to the earlier part of our discussion or uh, do we give the students enough vocabularies to describe the questions, you know, yep. or uh, if it's kind of a cultural background, uh, do the students have, I'm just thinking as, you know, my, more Asian background is, uh, oh, students should figure things out on their own. So I should not yep. ask a question. So there's so many, of, so many possibilities here that we really, if we want to um, cultivate a long-term trust and long-term uh, connection with students, we sh should not just take as granted, oh, no, no questions. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I appreciate what you said. Asking the question, do you have questions, isn't a question to ask because mm -hmm. there's not enough information there mm -hmm. um, you know the question is uh where are you having trouble mm -hmm. uh where in the piece have you gotten to that you can't figure out on your own where do you need my help mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of questions can get um, a greater amount of information and i appreciate what you just said as for lots of people i think for me as a child if someone said do you have any questions i said no automatically because I knew that if you had questions, you weren't smart. Right. That was my understanding. If you've got questions, that means you don't understand what's going on. You're a complete idiot. Look at all these other people over here. They had no questions in this class. They're the smart people. I'm the one that's got questions. I'm the one that doesn't know what's going on. Well, maybe just keep your mouth shut. Don't let anybody know that you're not smart. Yes, exactly. The, my childhood school experience is that. Um, and uh, open time, I mean, teachers didn't even ask do you have any questions <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go figure it out on your own and if you figure it out you're talented if you haven't you're not right um though i hope our discussion can help break that myth 